Talk to people who don't know construction, they tend to lump it all together. This is demolition. It's specialized. Not just the work, but the safety requirements. I spend a big chunk of my time hiring and training people who understand that specialty. You know, it's the difference between slowly building a wall, brick by brick, being careful that one doesn't fall, and demolishing that wall where intentionally you drop thousands of bricks at once. Both are safety problems, but demolition <laughs> takes it to a much higher level. Things move faster here. The structure changes dramatically. You have to adjust your thinking accordingly. And you just can't take anything for granted. New construction, well, you know what's there because you put it in. In demolition, you have to check out everything very carefully, especially things that might not be readily apparent, like utilities. We insist that our people inspect everything themselves to make sure there isn't a live electrical circuit or gas or a flammable liquid in a pipe or some hazardous substance left in a vessel. Doing a good job means being cautious first and getting the word out if there are any potential hazards. Our people have to know what they're doing, work together, be alert. We have safety meetings before starting every job. There's always something to cover. Safety isn't something we teach once on the way in. It's the way we do the job. Bottom line, you work safe or you don't work here. Yeah, demo can be hard work, but I didn't make foreman by goofing off. It's been a nice living for me and my family. You see, this is a serious business, and people that don't take it seriously don't last long. If somebody starts creating a hazard for themselves or for somebody else pretty soon, they're out of there. Me, I come home in one piece every night, and so does everybody that works with me. Now look at these boots. It takes heavy leather to work around rubble. And thick soles, they help protect against cuts and punctures. And if you're working around a lot of nails or sharp stuff, you can get boots with puncture-resistant soles. And if you're near heavy loads, steel toes can really save you. Same deal with gloves. I get what I need for the job. And cloth, that's fine for most rough stuff. But when I'm working around metal or sharp edges, I switch to leather. And when we get into solvents or chemicals, the company keeps some special rubber gloves in with the safety gear. If you use cloth gloves, the chemicals soak in, and they stay right next to the skin. That's right where you don't want them. We expect people to show up dressed for work. That means long sleeves if you need them, and a good pair of work boots and gloves. As for safety gear, we provide all the rest of the personal protective equipment. And we expect people to use it. For starters, everybody on the site wears a hard hat. Period. We have all types of eye protection, safety glasses, goggles, and face shields. If any of them get scratched or hard to see through, we will replace them. We want this stuff to get used. We've got both earplugs and earmuffs. People can take their pick. But if you're working around loud or constant noise, we want you to wear something. My rule of thumb is, if you can't hear a normal conversation that's only a few feet away without raising your voice, it's too loud. You're going to need some hearing protection. Respirators, now well, they're a little bit trickier. You've got several different types, and you have to match the respirator to the hazard. A dust mask isn't rated for asbestos, and the respirator a person would use for asbestos or lead may not work for vapors. And none of these actually supply any air. So if you're in a low oxygen environment, a filter respirator isn't going to supply any. There's some real hazards out there, and Wearing the wrong respirator, you know, that can be worse than no respirator at all. If someone isn't sure, we want them to ask. Before we turn a structure into pieces, we have to think about the materials that went into building it and what we could potentially be exposed to. Today, we know a lot more about some of these materials, which ones could be harmful, like lead, asbestos, silica, PCBs, and how to protect ourselves when working with them. As a safety director, it's my job to help supervisors and workers identify these hazards and deal with them safely. For example, 
hazards like asbestos and PCBs have to be safely removed and disposed of properly before general demolition begins. And we have safe work procedures for lead and silica that will protect our workers on the job. For all of these hazards, it's everybody's job to follow the safe work procedures we've established, including using the right personal protective equipment if you need it. We expect everyone on the site to protect themselves and the people around them when they could be exposed to these substances. Silica is just sand. I mean, it's everywhere. It's in the concrete, in the masonry, in plaster and stucco. It's on the ground. No big deal, really, unless it becomes airborne dust. You really don't want to be breathing this stuff. Over time, it has the potential to cause the lung disease silicosis. So you want to be looking out for the kind of things that create silica dust, like busting up plaster, or sawing concrete and masonry, or operations where concrete or masonry is being jackhammered or crushed or dumped. Operations that kick up a lot of dust should be sprayed down with water to keep the dust to a minimum. If you're in a situation where the dust can't be contained, you'll have to take measures to protect yourself. There's nothing like demolition for raising dust. That's why I often wear a respirator. And anybody who tells you these things are uncomfortable should try hacking or coughing for a while. Me, I go home breathing easy. When your respirator gets dirty or it's hard to breathe, it's done its job. Get a clean mask or replace your cartridges. There are situations where you might have to wear protective clothing, too. If that's the case, we'll provide it and show you how to use it and dispose of it properly. Keep in mind, protective clothing can't protect you if it's not fastened shut. If you get overheated, go to an area where you're not exposed before you open it up. Protective clothing should be removed before going into a lunch area or leaving for the day. Don't put the hazards back in the air by blowing or beating the dust off your clothing. Use a HEPAVAC. And if you're using a respirator, keep it on until you've removed your protective clothing. Nowadays, everybody knows asbestos is a hazard. Exposure's been related to cancer and lung disease, but not everybody knows how to identify asbestos on the job. And if you can't identify it, how are you gonna avoid it? Asbestos was a magic building material. The stuff was fireproof, flexible, strong, didn't rot, so it got used for a lot of different applications. Asbestos was pretty commonly used in pipe and duct insulation, surfacing material for sound deadening and insulation, roof flashing and insulation, ceiling tiles, and resilient floor coverings and underlayment. Safe work practices require getting rid of all the asbestos before we start demolition. We take asbestos abatement very seriously. Despite our best efforts, it's always possible for something to get overlooked or uncovered. So when you're on a demolition project and you come across any suspect material, stop and call your supervisor. It's always safer to assume they contain asbestos and not disturb them until they've been checked out by a competent person. If we determine that there's an asbestos hazard in the area, you'll be required to leave the area until a successful abatement has been accomplished. Everyone involved in asbestos abatement is required to have certified training on the health effects of asbestos exposure, the necessary PPE and how to use it, proper asbestos removal, engineering controls, proper disposal, and personal hygiene. Lead is another one of those materials. You don't see a lot of it in new construction. That's because we know more about the dangers of high lead levels and the long-term effects of lead accumulation in the body. To avoid it, you have to know where to look for it. Most of the lead we encounter on a demolition site is in old lead-based paint. This paint could have been used anywhere and everywhere. The other big source is lead used in plumbing. Lead solder, lead in piping or drains, lead flashing, and the lead in brass fixtures and bronze alloys. What we're concerned about with lead is inhaling it in dust or fumes or ingesting it, usually by getting it on your hands and then eating or drinking or smoking. You can inhale lead dust if you're sandblasting or grinding on surfaces lead-based paint, and the fumes are present when torch cutting or welding metals with lead-based paint or metals that have a lead content. When you're exposed to dust or fumes, to protect yourself, you'll need a respirator that's certified for the hazard. 
And this is another hazard where, depending on the concentrations, we may have you wear protective clothing. Whether we're talking lead or asbestos or even silica, hygiene is a key element in protecting yourself from the hazard. Don't drink or eat or smoke in a regulated area. I can't emphasize this enough. Most of these substances are only harmful if they get inside you somehow. Don't help the process along. Safely remove the dust from your clothes or remove your protective clothing and wash your hands and face thoroughly before you go into a clean lunch area. And don't take it home with you. Protect your family by changing clothes or safely removing the dust from your work clothes at the end of the day. One last item of concern is PCBs. These are a big environmental concern and we also want to limit any personal contact you might have with them. These compounds were often included in the oils used in large electrical transformers and even the ballasts in fluorescent lights. We'll inform you of any areas where PCBs exist and expect you to stay clear of them. If you're designated to work in one of these areas, we'll make sure that you get specific training in how to handle these materials and use the appropriate personal protective equipment. Whether you're working in one of these areas or just passing by, if you notice anything that looks like an oil spill around a transformer, we want to be notified right away. The bottom line for all of this is for you to stay safe and healthy. We'll inform you of the hazards we know about, but there's always the possibility of coming across something new. Like a mystery container with an unknown substance. Even if the container's labeled, people have been seriously injured when the label turned out to be incorrect. Let a competent person examine it first. Remember, things change dramatically in demolition, and you have to stay alert to what you're working with and what's going on around you. Fire? It's always a big concern. That's why we put together a fire safety plan before we ever get on site. Emergency access, water, fire extinguishers. And we take a close look at any fire or explosive hazards we can identify. We pass all this along to the crew, and we expect them to remember where the equipment is, and what the emergency procedures are, especially what the signal is for a fire alarm and where to go when you hear it. We're equipped to put out sparks and small blazes, but that's it. If the fire ever takes off, the rule is get out of there and sound the alarm. And if you hear the fire alarm, you should evacuate immediately. Then assemble for a head count. It's very important to understand that just because you're not in immediate danger, someone else might be. And we don't know who to help until we can identify who's missing. You know, a fire on the site could be a big disaster. And we have to take all the necessary precautions, especially to make sure that it's not a human tragedy. Yeah, when you figure you've got a lit torch, a tank full of fuel and oxygen, that qualifies as a fire hazard. But you can be plenty safe as long as you follow some basic rules. Like storing tanks safely, keeping them on a cart, or keeping them chained off so they stay upright while you're using them. Also, it's a good idea to keep a water hose or a fire extinguisher handy. You want to be ready before something starts to burn. You start welding or cutting, sparks are everywhere. So you've got to be protected everywhere. If your clothing or gloves have holes, take it from me. A spark will find it. That means long sleeves, cotton, wool, or some fire-resistant material. And some synthetics, that can even melt into your skin. Leather gloves, not cloth. And if they're oily or greasy, they're not protection, they're fuel. You know, before I ever picked up a torch with this outfit, I had to get some training. Now, I knew how to burn before I worked here. It doesn't make any difference. Everybody needs to go through a training period before working on this stuff. See, this isn't like welding in a shop or cutting in a yard somewhere. Demolition's tricky business. Now, I can show you some of the basics, but you'll still need to get some training before you go grab a torch and start burning. Now, most of this equipment sees some hard use, and you can never be sure who used it or for what before you got to it, so you've got to inspect it every time. Make sure your tanks are secured. Then get out of the way and crack the valves real quick to blow any dust out of the valves. You gotta be careful with this stuff. You never use it like compressed air to blow the dust off your clothes or to clean off a surface. Add enough oxygen, anything can burn.
Left and right threads make putting the regulators on pretty idiot-proof, but be careful. Tank is steel, gauge is brass. Something's going to give if you try to crank them down too tight. Look the hose over for wear, especially near the torch where it flexes all the time. Make sure the nozzles aren't plugged. Then hook the hoses to the regulator. Same deal, don't over-tighten these. Time for the moment of truth. Torch valves closed, regulator valves open, and open the tank valves just a crack to pressurize the system. You hear a hiss or smell gas, shut it down and troubleshoot the leak. Otherwise, you're good to go. Gas cylinder open about three quarters of a turn. You want to be able to shut this off quick if you need to. Oxygen all the way. And check your pressure on the gauges. Don't go over the recommended maximums. Before you fire up the torch, take some fire precautions. Common sense stuff, really. Check the area for anything that could catch a spark and burn. Either clear it away or cover it with a flame-proof tarp. Something I see all the time, guys on an upper floor not checking below. Slag could be dropping on paper, people, anything. Before you light up, look down. Now, I figure the most important thing I've got to protect from fire is me. So before I light up, I give my clothes a check. No oil on my hands or gloves. Shirt pocket button, gauntlet over my shirt cuffs, and pant legs over my boot tops. I want those sparks to roll right off. I generally use a tinted safety glass to help with the glare and a face shield for the sparks. A face shield by itself is an adequate eye protection. And when you flip it up, it doesn't protect much of anything. The point is, you need them both. To fire up the torch, you always have the oxygen turned off. And you just crack the propane valve a little, no more than a quarter turn. Use a striker to ignite the gas, and then turn on the oxygen and adjust the flame. Forget about using a match, and don't even think about lighting the torch with a cigarette, or lighting a cigarette with the torch. We're talking about some serious burn here. If you hear a squeal, it means you're getting a flashback. Shut it down right now and troubleshoot the problem. You turn the torch off the opposite way you light it. Oxygen first, then the propane. If I need to walk away from the rig, I shut off the cylinders. Oxygen first, then the propane. Then I bleed the pressure from the hose by opening and closing the torch valves. Trust me, there's a lot more to burning on a demolition site than knowing how to turn the torch on and off. You need to get specific training before you take this stuff on. I did, and I have never had a serious accident. We know a lot more about toxic materials these days. So if you're welding and cutting something that's been painted or galvanized, the fumes could be loaded with lead or zinc. That's nothing you want to be breathing. That's why we use these respirators. You know what makes us pros? It's not the ability to demolish a structure. It's be able to do it safely. I don't know. But my money running equipment on demolition takes more skill than new construction. I mean, you're not just moving materials around. You're, you're actually taking stuff apart. You've got to be able to read the structure, you know? You control it so it doesn't collapse unexpectedly. Making sure there isn't tension built up on a member you're cutting that could suddenly release. Especially if, uh, you know, something's bent or you can't see both ends. And nothing's a uniform size. Gets uh, pretty creative dealing with the pieces. From the sidewalk, it may look repetitious. But you really got to concentrate. Working around vehicles and equipment is a big part of the job. And it's easy to assume that the operator or driver is looking out for you. When you really should be looking out for each other. Mostly it's just staying out of the way or making sure they know I'm there, especially if I have to work behind the equipment. An operator can have two or three things to keep under control at once. He doesn't need someone else to worry about. Speaking of control, I trust these guys, but I wouldn't want to stand under a crane or next to a truck while it's being loaded. Stuff happens. I've seen materials slip and loads fall, and those were accidents. But if you want to keep it from being a disaster, stay away from it. Yeah, it really bothers me when someone gets under a load. I mean, anything can happen. 
You take some of this equipment, the wrecking balls and clam buckets and grapples, the material can be really unpredictable. People just have to flat out stay away. I mean, I can't be looking everywhere at once. Besides, there are some big blind spots in some of this equipment. So people should stay back from the machines and let me know where they are if they have to be working somewhere nearby. Just, just a wave or a little signal really helps. Speaking of signals, there is nothing more confusing than two people trying to give signals at the same time. Now, whether it's hand signals or the radio, I need to be working with one person. Now, hand signals are pretty easy. Anyone working with an operator should know the basics. If I can't see the load, I need to know exactly where and how to move. Now, somebody waving his arms and pointing just doesn't cut it. I don't always wear hearing protection, but if I'm working around equipment or power tools, I grab some earplugs. I can still hear conversations and backup warnings. But most importantly, at the end of the day, I can still hear. Yeah, I worry about my hearing. That's why I wear these. I know too many old timers who didn't. I mean, people told them they could ruin their hearing, but they didn't listen. Now some of them can't listen, if you know what I mean. The trouble is it sneaks up on you. You know, you go home with an engine roaring in your ears, and uh, after a couple hours, it's gone, so you figure it didn't hurt you any. But you do that day after day for years, and eventually you're saying what all the time. Now, when I wear hearing protection, I don't feel as beat after work. And I can hear myself think. One thing that really works on this job is having a little strategy. Figuring out your position. Using a little technique. I don't mean to make this sound like a game, because this is the real thing. But, for example, if you're ever in a building, especially those upper floors, scope out a couple of ways to get out of there. You know, using a little bit of strategy. And being aware of your position, you don't want to stand under an overhead load or near an exposed edge. That's what barriers are for, to make sure someone doesn't just wander into a work area or off an edge. And if it's your job to be on the other side of the barrier, stay alert. You ever hear of uh, getting caught between a rock and a hard place? Well, in demolition, that's more than just a saying. Moving as much material and equipment as we do, that's a position somebody could easily get into. I always have to be on the lookout for pinch points and places where somebody could get caught. And anyone working around the equipment needs to be looking too. A strong back is a big asset in this business, but you gotta use your head. You know, a little technique to keep it that way. I like to warm up a little bit. You know, stretch before doing any heavy lifting. And there's some common sense rules, like keeping your back straight, lift with your legs, and don't try to be a superman. Like I said, this is not a game or a competition. Get some extra manpower or some machine to do the heavy stuff. You know, in 10 years, I've never had a serious fall. And that's not luck. That's avoiding fall hazards and wearing a safety harness. And these days, you gotta have one if you're gonna be working more than six feet off the ground without a handrail. Tying off is important. If you fall, you need something that will take the impact, not just hold your weight. Handrails are out. You need to tie off your lanyard to some real structure, and preferably overhead, so there's no way you can fall more than six feet. Fall protection works. What's even better is not falling in the first place. If you stop to think about a cleanup, getting rid of stuff, well, that's what demolition is all about. And in order to do that, we're constantly making a mess. Trouble is, we can't have people stepping over debris or stepping on nails. Everybody has to keep their work area clean and keep a pathway cleared for the equipment and trucks that need access to the site. And it's critical not to get boxed into a corner with debris so you're cut off from an exit. Well, Delmo's definitely different. I mean, each load can be different. This isn't like hauling gravel. Sometimes it can be big pieces of concrete or steel. You never know what it's gonna be exactly. And I'm always concerned about loading. If you wanna keep things from going wrong, that's the time to do it. I stand clear of the truck when it's being loaded. I can help signal the operator if you can't see the truck. And if the load over slips or truck turns over, I'm out of the way. I guess the important thing is knowing what you can handle. Once I get out of the road, I'm responsible for it. I want a balanced load, and I can't be overweight or have material sticking out. 
then the operator who's loading doesn't always know what you're up against on the other end. If I've got some low clearance or a steep bank where the load could shift, I tell them. Then we can adjust the load accordingly. Controlling access to the site is something that we have to take charge of right up front and stay on top of. We've got trucks, equipment, and personnel that have to get in here. And just as important, we have to keep unauthorized people out. Buildings need to be secured, and we have to restrict pedestrian traffic. Sometimes you'd think demolition was a spectator sport. You've always got curiosity seekers hanging around, and you really have to protect them from themselves. That means keeping barriers in place so they don't wander out to the site. Even protect them from our work if it gets too close. I'm always on the lookout for safety, but I can't see it all. So I expect people to tell me when something is wrong, because if you wait, it'll only get worse. And if it's a safety hazard, somebody could get hurt. If someone's injured, same thing. You deal with it now, so a cut doesn't become infected, or a burn gets worse. The major purpose of our safety training is so that people can recognize a potentially dangerous situation when they see it. Most things, you know, people should be able to correct for themselves, right on the spot. Stuff like putting the barricade back up, covering a hole, wearing protective equipment. These things are part of the job. They should be automatic. If you see it, you do it. Anything else needs to be reported immediately. We have liability for those situations. If there's a hazard out there and someone's been injured, we have to know about it. And I expect people to be asking questions. We always have new people coming into the business, yet nobody knows it all or has done it all. There's only one dumb question here. That's the one that doesn't get asked. Like I said before, what makes us pros, yeah, it's not being able to demolish a structure, it's that we can do it safely.